I've been in the industry for actually over 20 years now. In that time, I've lost a bit of hair, but I've also picked up a few tips and tricks along the way. So today I'm going to share 20 with you. You ready? Let's go. 20. Come on. Where was the prompt of shouting out? All right. 20. Whether you're running a workshop, conference, or facilitating training, it's important to have breaks. But when should you have them? Studies have shown that there are two types of attention span. You've got transient attention, which is the time where one of your senses can focus without the other senses getting involved. That's eight seconds, so probably not worthwhile to use that. The other type is focused attention. That's where all your senses can work together. That's normally between 15 and 18 minutes, and is the reason why TED Talks are limited at 18 minutes. The average person is 17 minutes. Alongside that, you also have the ability to refocus. The average person can refocus twice before needing a longer break. So if we take first focus, first attention, focused, refocus, 53 minutes. So if you go by the wall of you come into a room, there's always nice pleasantries. You should go for breaks every 55 minutes. But there's more. So 19. Thank you. Um, what if you're the person facilitating? When do you get your time to refocus? The answer to that is to take mental breaks. So here's four ways that you can take a mental break. First, use terminology. Use something that you know inside out. So while you, you say it to the people in the room, you then have to explain it. But while you're explaining it, because it comes naturally to you, you can have a mental break. The next one is water. Always have water available. So if you need a mental break, you can easily come, pour yourself some water. Have a sip, and then carry on. Next one, draw pictures. So if you're doing a session where you've got a whiteboard, instead of just drawing lines and words, actually draw a picture. You'll be amazed at the amount of times that people just stop just to see what you're drawing, and it gives you time to refocus. The fourth one is ask a question you already know the answer to. The important thing here is making sure you frame it correctly so you're seeking clarification so that you don't use credibility, lose credibility. OK, 18. Thank you. Pixar's rule of storytelling. So Pixar has a number of different rules of storytelling. Here's number nine. When you're stuck, make a list of what wouldn't happen next. You'll be amazed at the amount of times the thing that should happen next just pops out. OK, size versus how. There's a lot of different devices that people design for nowadays, and everybody thinks about the breakpoints of where they are, but you've also got to think about how the person's going to use them. There's a lot of difference between how someone uses a smartphone in portrait mode with one finger, or landscape with two, or if someone's using the tablet, if they're holding the tablet to oppose as if it's in a display and they're clicking the buttons. So don't just think about what your breakpoints are, think about how they're going to use it. Getting louder. Nice. I'm not going to go into detail on this one. Just say, look, at the, look up the UX honeycomb and in your own time, and look at how you can add all of these different facets into your work. Nice. Use alternate words. How many times have you gone to do something um, and somebody says that they've already got it? This is the right time to use alternate words. My favorite is personas. I do a lot of vendor work, and I've been into places, and they say that they've got personas. But when you actually look at them, they are complete shit. <laughs> and so in order to not offend them, in order to, as a vendor, not to make it look as if you're trying to get more money out of them, um, you can use alternate words. And that's why I like to use audience. And so I say, let's do an exercise on our audience so that we can clarify and validate the personas when really it's a way of making sure that they realize that they're shit and we're going to redo them. Other things you can do, wireframes versus mockups, visual design versus high fidelity, or generally I find just throw the word cadence into a sentence because people don't know. <laughs> Never make personas <laughs> without speaking to actual people. So fair enough if you do an exercise with an internal team, maybe, or you use data analytics to find out who the initial audience are. You may even call them assumptive personas, but they should only ever be used to find, work out who you actually want to get involved in UX testing or co-design or interviews. 
and then you can make your personas. <laughs> analytics. Okay, here's one tip on analytics, and that's use segments. So segments are really good. Within um, your Google, you have a big, nice button at the top saying, add segment. Here, you can choose from a long list of different ways of grouping up your data automatically. The one I like the most, non-bounced sessions. So what non-bounced sessions is, it gets rid of all those people that have come to your site and they're not actually where they want to be. A prime example of this is if you've got an intranet site that's set up as the default on a browser. Someone comes in, they open their browser up, automatically they've gone straight off to Google, Facebook, wherever they want to go, and you don't want those stats ruining your um, data. So you can pull them out and you can see what the difference is. So you can get rid of those. So non-bounce sessions. <laughs> Fold is still important. Okay? The Norman Nielsen Group did a study looking at multiple page websites and they found that 57% of the time was spent above the fold. 17% on the next one and 27% after that. So it's important to look at that. But you've also got to remember with the fold about the illusion of completeness. If something seems to be complete, it is complete. How many times have you gone to a website, seen a full page banner at the top, or maybe a carousel that fills the whole of the screen, and you're like, that didn't tell me anything, only to find out when you scroll that there's more content and more content below that. That's where you need to make sure that the illusion of completeness isn't working against you. So think about the size, think about the how familiar, think about where your breakpoints are, and think about where your key information and your call to actions are in response. <laughs> Micro-interactions. <laughs> Love them. But make sure they add context and aren't just unnecessary polish. The other thing to make sure is that they don't produce accessibility issues. You don't want to be the, have the context of the micro-interaction to be the only thing that helps. Pseudo-certainty effect. OK. People are more risk-averse if, the if, if they see the outcome as positive and more risk-seeking if they see the outcome as negative. So take a uh, sports team, for instance. If they're winning a game, they see the outcome as positive, so they're less likely to take risks. Whereas if they're losing the game, it's negative, so they're more likely to take risks. So you can help that in your work, guide people to make the right decisions. But you have to be ethical about it, because this is the technique that all scammers use to make you click those buttons, download the software, because they make you perceive the outcome as negative. Have many tasks. So when you're running a co-design workshop, you may split into groups, and there's always one group that does works faster than another. But you want to make sure that all people have the amount of time allocated to the task. That way, that's where you should have many tasks available. So I've got two that I normally call on. One to do with a, like a mini card sorting, or one where it's a visual word list play, so that you can give those to that team, and it's giving you that extra information but you're not stopping the other people from completing their tasks. Information density. So here's a question for you. What is the most important word in this sentence? Sometimes you see people use their styling and use their information density against them by emphasizing things that shouldn't be emphasized. The important thing as well here is to make sure that your information density matches your information hierarchy so that people with accessibility issues are getting the same messaging as people without. Better. Amount of words. OK. It's often better to use less words to describe things so that it doesn't age confusion. Here's a couple of examples. Visually ensure the mode select handle is fully inside the red placard for armed or green placard for disarmed. Surely that would have been easier to just put red equals armed, green equals disarmed. Or one that I found. Access to this area is restricted to approved personnel only. Restrictions do not apply to employees of blah, blah group and blah, blah, NZ limited. Staff only probably would have been miles easier. <laughs> so think about the amount of words that you're using and make it appropriate. Oh, sorry. 
since we're public. Um, make sure you close all notifications when doing a presentation, because you never know what's going to pop up. Questions? So while I was at university, um, the most I actually got out of it was I was on the student union exec. Um, it did mean I was a trustee of the bar, so I could go into the bar without queuing on a Friday and Saturday night, so it had its perks. But one of the things I did was I ran the welfare center. And so this was the advice um, center for students to come to. And because of that, I learned a lot about um, counseling and listening skills. And from that, I took the role of OOK. Ask an open question to find out about the person, let them express themselves. Ask another open question in order for them to find what they're saying. And then finally, ask a closed question to get clarification. This is really good within the workshop setting or interview setting to get the most out of your participants. Serial position effect. So this is a term coined by Herman Eppinghaus, who Crystal mentioned yesterday. And this is all around the ability for people to recall things based on when they heard them. So this is used a lot in marketing. If we look at an example from the Tesla website, these are the pages that they have for their Model 3. You have two things here. You have the primacy effect, where people are more likely to recall what they first saw or heard, and the recency effect, where people are most likely to recall the last things. Generally, they don't remember as much in the middle. So here you can see Tesla, they've done their research and they've seen that from the user's point of view, they're interested in safety, performance, and specs, whereas internally Tesla want you to buy one and order it. So think about how you can order your lists and how if you've got the same order over and over again in a survey or something, your results are going to be tainted. Information design principles. So print design has been around a lot longer than web or mobile design. So they've developed a number of principles and layouts that they use within there. So these are the core five that they use. Some of them you'll see are definitely um, rely related to what you see. Hierarchical, used a lot within websites. Modular, used a lot within apps. But I challenge you, think about how you can use the others within your designs. Right, people's names. If you're facilitating a co-design workshop, it's always hard because you've got a lot of pressure, you've got a lot of think about, you've got to read the room, do the timing and everything like that. How do you remember the people's names? This is how I do it. So, I start by doing the round the table and the introductions at the start, and I remember one person's name. Then what I do is I give the first exercise is with a piece of paper for each individual person to do. Um, usually I've got one that involves mapping out a process flow, showing all the emotions on there, so it's a good venting exercise as well. So if you want to know more about that, talk to me afterwards. Um, but what I do is at the end I go, can everybody write their name on the piece of paper so that when we take it away, we've got something that we can remember and if we can talk to you about anything. And so they write their names down, so I could then go, okay, can we play back Sarah, who's the first only person's name I've remembered. Can you, can you play back? And while Sarah's playing back, I'll move around the room so that I'm looking at her to get eye contact when really I'm actually staring over the person's shoulder and reading their name off the paper. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, David, would you like to go next? <laughs> And then everybody feels, and you carry on around the room, everybody feels that they get the personal touch and think, God, they remembered me. But no, I just read your name off a piece of paper. <laughs> Lastly. OK, there's a lot of people here with a lot of different experience. Everybody can add value. So at the next break, ask someone what their tip is and share one of your own. Thank you.